Too Long Didn't Read, from the Alan Turing Institute, the UK's National Institute for Data Science and AI. Welcome to Too Long Didn't Read, the most delicious way to devour the intricacies of the AI smorgasbord and the final episode of the season. In the new year, we will be back, but maybe in a slightly different format, probably not weekly, maybe something more akin to monthly. We're not entirely sure. Watch this space. I'm Jonah, a content producer here at The Turing, and here's the lady who puts the I in AI and the thick in (laughs) ethics, Snera. Did you say the thick in ethics? (laughs) That's really good. Hi, everyone. My name's Snera, and I'm a research assistant in data justice and global ethical futures. DJ Jeff. I actually put the we in AI. If you've actually been listening to the podcast, you would know that, Jonah. (laughs) Yeah, right. Okay, I wondered where you were going there. Yes, you put the we in AI. (laughs) Very clever. Well, listeners, I hope Santa was generous when he emptied his sack for you. This week, we will be digging into our post bag and answering some very excellent listeners' questions. We will also revisit some of the stories that were deemed too rubbish for us to cover during this series. Onwards! Sarah, I thought that it would be fun to delve into our own sack of uh, joy um, <laughs> and read some listeners' letters. Because that, that. we've got some great questions mm-hmm, throughout mm-hmm, the series. Mm-hmm. First off, we have Rosie from London who has said, You said in an earlier episode that AI is neither artificial nor intelligent. But it seems like unless I have two PhDs and the biggest brain in the world, I have no chance of understanding how it actually works. What does AI look like under the bonnet? It's data science, so is it essentially a load of spreadsheets? Simple answer, please. Bullet points. (laughs) Yes, uh, I would say the spreadsheet would would essentially be the data. And then you have a a little instructions pamphlet that that the model has. But all of this doesn't make it intelligent and it definitely doesn't give it any form of an emotional quotient which I think we would use in our understanding of how intelligent someone is. And I would say... I would rather be in conversation with someone who has wisdom than just pure knowledge. And AI is just not going to have that. So that in that sense, it is not intelligent. So under the bonnet, there is a spreadsheet, which is the data. There's uh, instructions, mm-hmm. which is the algorithm. And then the machine learning bit is putting those two together and you get an outcome, which is what we would call AI, right? Yes. Perfect. Hope that answers your question, Rosie. Matt from Midhurst says, why aren't we hearing more about AI for medical applications? Surely it can be harnessed to supercharge cures. He obviously hasn't been listening to our podcast that much because uh, we have talked about that a little bit. Uh, I wonder, though, uh, in in an extension of his question... Mm -hmm. Why haven't any massive cures come yet? Like there's been a lot of advances and a lot of um, procedures that have been uh, sped up or um, honed better. Mm -hmm. But why aren't there massive cures? If I'm not mistaken, I think um, there was a supercomputer that played a role in even the drug discovery for the COVID vaccine. So it is it is there. I think in terms of the whole research arena it has to pass through so many levels of testing so maybe they might have a hypothesis that this if you work on a protein in this way it could provide this kind of a function but it has to pass through all those levels of testing before it can reach and i'm sure if you go up to to a regulator and you're like hey a computer told me this is the answer (laughs) they might still be a bit apprehensive to let you start testing it on so is part of the answer that ai and um, machine learning hasn't been around maybe long enough yet to have made those massive cures that we will one day say that's all because of AI. Yes, I'm hoping we don't say that. I think that's all because of the people who train the AI. <laughs> yeah, Jonah, have you not? Point. Have you point. not? Should been have learned listening? by now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next up, we have Alex from London. Mm-hmm. How does intellectual property work with AI? If a researcher uses Microsoft's AI to invent something or find a new drug or something, does Microsoft have a claim on the patent? That's quite an interesting one, right? Mm, yeah. So we've we've covered open source yeah. um, previously, which is obviously sort of the, the way to go, the share all. Mm-hmm. But are these big tech companies that we keep talking about going to be um, asking for a bit of remuneration when their ideas get used or is that already happening? I'm not sure if it's already happening and I don't know how much it works in other industries, but for research, there are a lot of... Um, a lot of journals that ask you to sp- state if an AI was used in in writing it because it is some form of an aid, right? So it is doing yeah. something in reaching that goal that you want to, and you have to state all the facts, all the 
the steps that you've taken. So in that sense, okay. there is so a record. sort of citing your research. Yeah. yeah. But also it, it's a bit weird because the model's trained on the intellectual property of others. So it's not really the model yes. that has, that's ever created something. It's never had its own copyright creation, but it's just trained on someone else's work. So they could never, yeah. they could never monetize on it. And I think the courts would yeah, never uphold right. that. That's kind of like trying to copyright a uh, cooking recipe, mm -hmm. whereas you'd have to have copyright did all the ingredients prior to that or whatever. Copy wrote? Copy wrote? I don't yeah. know. <laughs> We've got a letter here from Rajni from Bengaluru, which reads, From what I hear, AI is the new dot 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 dot. If so, would a formal school education be of any use in the future, given the fact that kids imbibe so many subjects in their younger years? I think it's, it's a really interesting point because we see you know, the school system primarily as a way of getting education. But I think if you're a parent, and as you, Jonah, would probably be able to like attest to this, it's also a good babysitting service for a good 10 years of like <laughs> your life. So I don't think it, that's going to go anywhere if you want productivity to remain the same as it is. So I don't think the school systems are going to go at least for that one reason. But that would be horrendous. <laughs> <laughs> but more technically speaking, I think um, it's not going to go because not a lot of schools are going to have access to AI in any case. So there are going to be a lot of them that are going to focus on different fields. There will always be those education institutes that are more focused on, say, sports, and they kind of have like a bit of academia on the side. So yeah. what's going to happen to those? But I don't think the concept of education systems is not going anywhere. So I've got a, a question here. Um, in, you know, to be transparent, this one is, well, also from a listener, but he's my dad. Aww. So I'll read you his words exactly. Mm-hmm. I was thinking of the worry that AI could end up controlling people. To do this, machines would need to behave like our brains, where memory is a vital component. For example, passing a tree within a second, we have identified it as a tree, maybe the type, and what it might be used for, i.e. building or foraging mm -hmm. or whatever, and considered that it could be shelter if it had leaves, but also register that it may not have leaves in autumn, etc. So, mm -hmm. so many instantaneous thoughts, all dependent on our memory. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how memory works. He doesn't. I don't either. But he <laughs> says, I don't know how memory works. Is there an equivalent electronic device which would act in the same way in a machine? So my, I initially wanted to answer him myself because uh, when Mike Wooldridge last week in the Turing Lecture mm -hmm. talked mm -hmm. about neural networks, that sort of is a way of memory, isn't it? Using yeah. all these uh, basically identifying pixels and sending them off to the yes, no kind of answers. And then this network goes massive like synapses mm -hmm. in a brain. Yeah. But maybe you should do this bit because that's not my area of expertise. I know that neural networks were literally created because they wanted to try and, you know, replicate how the brain would work. But even it's really when you start looking into it, from what I understand, or maybe the limited research that I've done on how the brain works, you know, being not a brain expert myself. But you are right in the first part of your answer in that the 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 storage of data and the cloud computing, that is basically where all of that information is stored, that, that serves as the computer's brain. So it seems that maybe the part about memory from my dad's question is actually the easy bit. Um, for example, if you're talking to a chatbot, that's generative AI. Mm -hmm. The memory or the cache of data is the internet. It uses the entirety of the internet to get its information. And the AI bit is mm -hmm. the complex bit. So in this case, a neural network, which resembles how yeah. human brain works, is the more complex part of the machine learning. Yes, yes. Is that right? Yeah, and if it reaches with certain techniques, if it reaches an answer that's not the conclusion that it's supposed to be reaching, then it just back propagates and tries to like relearn what it's trying to do. Right, and, yes. And reapply those same techniques. So yeah, I, yeah. I, it, so it's a simple dance of like checklists really that, yeah. that the um that the computer's doing so that's kind of the answer dad mm. uh also i will point you to mike waldridge turing lecture when it mm. comes out and also other podcasts which i know my dad likes life scientific julia shaw on it covers a brilliant uh, episode on memory and how they they aren't actually um as infallible as we might like to believe John in Guildford asks, what are the actual benefits to the human race switching over to AI in society, like AI doctors and driverless cars? Oh, OK. I know. I know. I always That's sound like one. I know I always sound like the person like, no, we should not use technology. We should just live in the past and we should like use bronze again. Uh, but in terms of the benefits that we could have, say in terms of AI doctors, it could actually help doctors, um, you know, maybe write more legible prescriptions. <laughs> <laughs> um 
but it can help like radiologists understand different x-rays i think maybe instead of fully shifting over to driverless cars we could probably have ai that could help say disabled folks and people with disabilities in uh, navigating their cars and using it with a lot more comfort than they probably currently have we've mentioned protein discovery that it could be huge for it can also uh, map mining the moon finding out where different um, aspects live and it could also do that very crucial bit of making those connections which we as humans might not end up doing a model might be able to actually do that it might figure out that this one effect from a is actually doing this to b and this is why all these different aspects are connected so this could be one of those like truly life changing and you know human race changing aspects that we could actually look forward to so there wow. are ways we can help positive smera you know, on the case yeah yeah like it but as ai as in as an aid not ai as a replacement yes Next, we have Max in Cambridge. Uh, he has two questions. One, how is AI actually able to replicate some form of human consciousness, a.k.a. how does AI like ChatGPT actually think? Max Mera would answer that with an aggressive, it doesn't think, or something along those lines. And um, so I would point you to neural networks being the answer there. And if you watch Mike Wooldridge's Turing Lecture... He will explain it better than I ever can. So the link will be in the show notes there. It replicates human data points that we humans have collected and put into a system. Yeah, that. Max's second question, which I think is really interesting, is what has caused the sudden recent surge in AI? I think because we there were a lot of things that we, people would call AI in the past, but it wasn't. It's not like it is now, but it it's improved so much that computing has improved so much that now it actually feels like the AI we were describing and not just like a really smart computer. So I think that's contributed to us actually seeing that, oh, AI is actually working. It's being implemented. More governments were using it in their tools. More companies were releasing tools with AI. So that's like one of the first phases. But when it comes to generative AI, I think that inflection point was the first Google paper that was released that spoke about, you know, how a generative pertain transformer could actually work. And that one paper actually influenced OpenAI to, to create it. And once that happened, we not only saw more models being released, but other companies and even Google catching up to the own research that they released. So that was truly an inflection point, at least on the research side of it. This, uh, this one is from Thera from Derry. How much of a part does sci-fi play in AI? I like that one. I, I really do. I really do too. No, I think science fiction plays a huge role because even the term AI itself was was coined by, coined with science fiction, and you kind of need to have that level of imagination to really get something going. If you didn't have people thinking about a car that could fly, we probably wouldn't even get to a point. Like yeah. you, you know, you 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 need that, and I think a lot of those come from the kind of ideals that you can put down in fictional writing and sci-fi dystopian sci-fi is really really good and probably the dystopian one can warn us about what not to do yeah i mean there must have been so many people in science and technology now that were influenced by amazing and far out ideas written by sci-fi authors or filmmakers um, from their youth mm -hmm. i think it's a valid thing to link creativity with scientific endeavor yeah, yeah. you need to be creative to sort of get there don't yeah, you yeah yeah and I, I think it's good for imagination but it's a good measurement as well of or like a lit litmus test on what the bounds of you you know what what your own limitations are as a group yeah yeah i think we could probably do an episode of sci-fi yeah, one day yeah. so there we go listeners letters listlessly answered during this season, we have been feverishly trawling the web in search for the most prime nuggets of AI goodness for our episodes. There were quite a few stories that um, Jesse and I were finding. We seem to be drawn to maybe the less <laughs> academic sounding ones. And uh, Smera, you would bat them right back uh, with, a, with a little <laughs> laughy face. So I want to go through some of those stories right now and see why you deem them so um, <laughs> pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that sounds fun. Let's go. So we have a smart speaker that knows when you're drunk. That sounds, I mean, I can't think of a use case, but that sounds cool, right? Sure. I mean, I don't, <laughs> I really don't <laughs> want my speaker listening into me when, you know, I manage to get back home at 2 or 6 a.m. in the morning. So I think the vulnerable community in this situation was me. <laughs> And that is simply yeah. why I did not want to do it. I do not want to encourage this behavior. <laughs> I thought it sounded cool. Saying it out loud now, I realize it sounds useless. Okay, the next one is 
an AI head teacher that was appointed uh, at a UK boarding school. That sounds like a very, I mean, obviously I don't want to put <laughs> vulnerable head teaching communities out of work, but um, that sounds like a good idea or at least a clever the, idea. The boarding school that made use of it said head teaching is a very lonely job and which is why they could do with an AI to help them. And Really? I, yeah. I think if you're a head teacher of a school with lots of pupils and you find it lonely, <laughs> you're possibly in the wrong job. <laughs> Okay, well, I'd bat that one away yeah, then. No, I, that's I think it, it didn't really do much head teaching, more helping the the actual human head teacher. And oh, okay. So there was one for you. Why is it for me? I mean, it could be for you. It's for me because I uh, have sperm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's an article that says keeping your mobile phone in your pocket could lower your sperm count. Um, I actually remember when I was in year... Eight, Mr. Biaggi was our physics teacher. It was when mobile phones were coming out and he was like, I would never keep one in my pocket. So, and it's always stuck with me, even when I've constantly kept one in my pocket since, um, since getting one. But uh, is there any truth in that? Should people be worried about their sperm count by keeping an innocent radioactive block of technology in their pocket all the time? <laughs> <laughs> I think we're venturing into the 5G conspiracy tinfoil hat um, arena. But if I'm not mistaken, I think the study couldn't actually prove nor disprove what was happening. So it's true. Basically true. It it could be. It could not be. It's a quantum state of sperm count. (laughs) Quantum state of sperm count. That is a band name. That's it for this episode and this series of Too Long Didn't Read. Um, Thank you so much, Smira, for joining me for this wonderful ride. And thank you, Jonah. And thank you to Jesse for overseeing us and keeping us sort of vaguely in line with, I presume, a very wobbly line that she has in her mind. (laughs) (laughs) We will be back in 2024, so keep an eye on our Instagram, The Turing Inst, our Twitter... Turing Inst. You can still email us, podcast at turing.ac.uk. So um, that's about it. Thanks very much for listening. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Toodles. (laughs) Ta-ta.